The last thing that we want to talk about is checking to make sure that the probability model that we're proposing to model a particular process provides a reasonable enough reflection of that true process to be useful in answering the questions that we have. So how do we check a probability mass function for reasonableness? Now, very often, just based on the description of the random process, we're going to be able to propose you know, one of the notorious distributions, maybe a Poisson, or a negative binomial, or a uniform distribution. Or we might have a shape that we really like. We know how to convert that into a PMF. The question lingers, OK, well, is that the right probability model? Now, one thing that we know is that the real world is always going to be more sophisticated and more complex than any probability model can really hope to capture. We know that all probability models are wrong, but some still might be useful. So our goal is to make sure our probability model isn't too wrong and that we can still use it to actually answer the questions we have about this random process. So the way that we're going to check the reasonability of a probability model is with a graphical procedure. Now, in other classes, you'll learn about formal statistical tests to let you know if the data that you've collected is you know, statistically consistent from a proposed probability model. But I think that's really overkill because we're going into this procedure knowing that we haven't proposed the right model. It's wrong. So if we reject that fit and we say, nope, that's not the right probability model, we haven't discovered anything new. We knew it was wrong to begin with. We're more interested in just knowing, is it close enough for us to be useful here? And the graphical comparison really helps to hit that home. We'll be able to see just how close our fit is. So how are we going to do this? Well, what we're going to do is to compare the CDF of the proposed probability model, that capital F, the probability of observing a value of most little x, with the empirical cumulative distribution function, the ECDF. Now, the empirical cumulative distribution function is simply just the fraction of data values that are less than or equal to some number that we've seen in the data as we vary that number to bigger and bigger quantities. So what fraction of data values are less than or equal to eight? Well, that should match up pretty well with the probability of observing a value that's less than or equal to eight with your proposed probability model. So we're gonna compare these two quantities, the cumulative distribution function of your proposed probability model and the empirical cumulative distribution function from the data that you've collected. And there should be a close enough correspondence to let you know that that seems to be a fairly reasonable model. So here's an example. How would we get the empirical cumulative distribution function from the following set of data? Let's imagine that we know that we're actually picking random numbers from a Poisson distribution with a lambda of three, an average value of three. So if we wanted to get the empirical cumulative distribution function, what we would do is for each unique value that we've observed, calculate the fraction of values that are at most that value. So we get some zeros, we get some ones, we get some twos. The ECDF evaluated at zero would be the fraction of data values that are zero or smaller. Works out to be 10%. If we wanted the ECDF at two, we would calculate the fraction of data values that are two or smaller, zero, one, or two, which we would find out to be 40%. I think the easiest way to get the fraction of values that meet that condition is to take mean of the logical condition as you've specified it. So we can plot the empirical distribution function as the same way that we did the proposed PD, uh, CDF of the probability model that we're looking at. We can essentially create a stair-step plot that lets us know how the fraction of data values that are less than or equal to a certain value of x, how that changes as we increase x to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So we get this set of stair steps where each horizontal line actually contains the endpoint on the left but doesn't contain the endpoints on the right. And that's because of the definition. We're trying to get the probability of at most a particular value. So it's going to be the same value if it's less than or equal to 3, then it is less than or equal to 3.5, 3.7, 3.9, etc. So that's what we want to do. We want to compare, you know, what does our data actually look like with the proposed probability model in terms of the CDF versus empirical CDF 
And then also we can compare basically the frequencies of each value we see in the data with the PMF of the data as well. Looking at them side by side is useful, but really it's the one on the right here, the comparison of cumulative distribution functions that'll have the final call. So for that set of 50 values that we know were generated from a Poisson distribution with a lambda equal to three, we can see with the plot on the left, the comparison of the empirical frequencies with the probabilities of the proposed probability model, that we get a pretty reasonable match. So the heights of the black bars tell us the frequencies of each of the data values in our data. The red bars tell us the theoretical probabilities according to the probability model. And we see a rough correspondence indicating that you know, it's kind of a reasonable fit here. We don't expect exact correspondence, but it's matching up pretty reasonable. Now, a more definitive call can be made from looking at the plot on the right, comparing the empirical cumulative distribution function with the CDF proposed by the probability model that we want to use. So what we see is a red stair step that lays out what the CDF of the proposed prob probability model looks like. And to keep the graph clear, we're only going to put certain points on that plot that correspond to the unique values of the data that we've collected and what the values of the ECDF are at those points. So what we're going to do is overplot on those stair steps the fraction of data values that are zero or less, that are one or less, that are two or less, that are three or less, etc. Now to be a pretty good match, what we need to have is that those points need to fall on the corners of those stair steps, the outer corners of those stair steps. If we see that, then it's a pretty good fit. If we don't see that, well, there's some noticeable difference between what we're observing in our data and what the probability model can really provide us. So here's an example of a good fit. Here I'm actually taking a sample of 50,000 random numbers from a Poisson distribution with a lambda equal to six. I'm fitting it to a Poisson and I'm comparing the empirical frequencies with the PMF on the left and the empirical cumulative distribution function with the CDF of the proposed Poisson on the right. I see that the empirical frequencies and the theoretical probabilities match up pretty well. There's not much of a difference. And I see when I compare the ECDF to the CDF that the actual fraction of data values that are less than or equal to zero, one, two, three, four, etc., are matching up very closely to what the CDF of the proposed uh, distribution gives us. So all those points are falling on the outer uh, corners of those stairs. Now a bad fit would look like this. If I instead fit the collection of data values to a binomial distribution, I know it's coming from a Poisson, so it's a very bad model, I see a very severe uh, mismatch between the empirical frequencies of each data value and the theoretical probabilities of observing them. And if I compare the ECDF to the CDF on the right, I'm seeing that those points don't fall anywhere close to the outer edges of those stairs. I'm not getting a good match between the actual fraction of data values that are five or less, and in theory, the probability of observing a value of five or less with this uh, binomial probability model. So bad match, not a very reasonable fit to the data. So how do we want to do this in R? Well, the good news is, is that someone created a package called FitDistr Plus that's going to take care of all the details for us. All we're going to have to do is learn the syntax and we can make these plots and basically decide whether or not we think it's a reasonable fit. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a data vector. We're going to call it X. And what we'll do is run the command FitDist on it. So the first argument of fit dist, fit distribution, will be your data vector. And the second argument in quotes is going to be the name of the distribution, at least how R knows it. So if you want to fit to a Poisson distribution, Poiss will be in double quotes. If you want to fit it to a negative binomial distribution, n binome is going to be in quotes. Fitting it to a binomial is a little bit weird. The syntax gets a little bit more sophisticated. You have to tell it what the value of n is that you're considering and it'll go and try to search over the, the best fitting value of P here. But the key thing is, once you run fit dist, we'll just left arrow that into an object, capital fit. If we just do plot fit, that'll give us those two plots for us to compare and check to see is the fit reasonable. 
Now, what if we're not dealing with one of those notorious distributions? What if we proposed a probability model and we'd like to know, does it fit or does it not? Well, we can still do that, but we have to define a few custom functions that give the PMF of the probability distribution and the CDF of the probability distribution that we would like to use. So for example, that zero truncated Poisson, very important distribution in business analytics. It's our go-to model for a count where the counts start at one instead of zero. That's not a PMF that R knows about in the base package, but we can still program it in to make sure it's a reasonable model if we think we're dealing with data that comes from that distribution. So how do we do that? Well, we need to define the PMF and the CDF of this uh, probability distribution, the D and the P functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up with a name that we're going to refer to this distribution internally, just like how R refers to binomial as binome. We're going to come up with a name that we want to give to this distribution, this zero truncated Poisson distribution. So let's use the name ZT Poisson. Why not? Zero truncated Poisson. So we're going to define a function in R by taking that name and prefacing it with a D. We want to define D, uh, ZT Poisson, and tell it, okay, here's how you get the probabilities of observing each value. So we'll define it to be a function taking two arguments, x and lambda. Lambda is one of those free parameters that dictate the average, the shape of that distribution. And we can write some code that say, okay, for every possible value of x we might throw at it, here's what the corresponding probability is going to be. If it's zero or something smaller, the probability of observing that is zero. Otherwise, if it's one, two, three, four, etc., we know the formula for how to get that probability. It's related to DPOS, the PMF values from a Poisson. And then we'll give a function that gives the CDF as well, the PZT Poisson function. So here we have to be very careful with the names of the arguments that we're giving this function. The first argument, we always have to call it Q. That's just a convention we have to respect. The second argument, we'll call it lambda still to be con uh, uh, consistent with the way that we define the D function. And we have to go through and essentially write a for loop that says, okay, for every element of the Q vector that we're passing to it, here's how you get the probability of observing at most that value. Now, fit just actually needs a third function, the Q function, the quantile function to be defined, but it turns out we don't actually have to explicitly tell it what it is for us to do this graphical method. So we can just say QZT plus left arrow function, first argument has to be P, that's just a convention, second argument, lambda, what's dictating the shape. So if we wanted to fit our data to a truncated uh, Poisson distribution. We can generate some data. Let's just generate some random numbers from a Poisson distribution, then filter out the values that are zero. Let's keep only the ones that are greater than zero. Well, here's our data. We see one 1,327 times. We see nine a total of 51 times. Does the zero truncated Poisson provide a reasonable fit? We can run fit dist on it. So x is the name of our data vector. That's going to be the first argument. We assigned internally the name ZT plus to refer to this P, uh, PMF. We define the D function, we define the P and the Q functions. So we'll put ZT plus in quotes. Now, because it's not a function that R knows about internally, we have to add a few extra arguments. We'll add the argument discrete equals true to let it know that, hey, this is a discrete quantity that we're trying to model. And we'll give it a good starting guess for what that value of lambda that dictates the shape you know, the average value of that probability distribution might be. It'll go and hunt for the best fitting one. We don't have to worry about that right now. So we say, okay, go fit it to this zero truncated Poisson distribution and report back to us how well it fits. So plot on the left is comparing the empirical frequencies of each data value with the theoretical frequencies, the probabilities, according to that zero truncated Poisson model. On the right, that's really where we want to look. That's comparing the cumulative distribution function of our proposed probability model, that capital F function for the zero truncated Poisson, with the empirical cumulative distribution function. So what do we look for? Well, we want to see those dots fall on the outer edges of those stairs. That'll let us know that the actual fraction of data values that are six or less is matching up to the probability of finding a value of six or less according to that probability model. So pretty good fit overall. 
So one thing to be aware of when you are fitting custom functions in the fit distor plus package is that the authors decided to encode a bunch of really cryptic warnings that I'm still not sure how to get rid of and I'm not sure, I don't think they actually affect any of those results. So if you start to see warnings like, oops, the P function of that custom function that you're, you're defining should be returning a vector of NAs or NAN values, just ignore that. I don't know what they really correspond to. The stuff works fine. I'm not sure what the authors were trying to get at when they made those warnings pop out. So we mentioned that in our notorious zoo, we have that uniform distribution. All values inside of a range are equally likely. R doesn't actually have that PMF built in. In case you're curious to know what those are, I've defined the D and the P and the Q functions for you so that you can fit something to a uniform distribution to see, hey, is it a pretty good fit? Are all values equally likely? So for example, let's run the sample command on the integer sequence two through 14. So let's randomly pick 500 of these values between two and 14 with replacement. So let's check to see, is that uniform distribution a good fit? Well, comparing the empirical frequencies of each data value with the theoretical frequencies, the probabilities with our probability model, what we find is that there's a pretty decent correspondence. All the red bars are at the same value because they're all equally likely according to that PMF. We see some that are a little bit more, some that are a little bit less, but a pretty close correspondence. What we really want to look at is the comparison of the CDF plots, the empirical frequencies of having a value of at most x with the theoretical probabilities of getting that value of at most x. So we see that these dots are right along the outer edges of the stair steps. This is a great fit, and it should have been because we know that's where the data values actually came from. And so now you're masters at modeling discrete quantities.